Hi everyone, this lesson is on euthyroid sick syndrome. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about what this is and why it occurs. So let's talk about what euthyroid sick syndrome is. So it's also known as sick euthyroid syndrome or non-thyroidal illness syndrome. So there's multiple names for this. It is a disorder, but more specifically, it is a clinical finding involving abnormal thyroid hormone levels, and these thyroid hormone levels are often going to be decreased, and it occurs in patients with acute and chronic serious illness, injury, or trauma. So if we were to actually look at the word euthyroid, so if you were to look at euthyroid sick syndrome or sick euthyroid syndrome, the word euthyroid can tell us a lot about what this is. So if we were to actually break it down, the prefix eu refers to a normal condition, and the suffix thyroid refers to the thyroid gland. So euthyroid means a normal thyroid gland. So euthyroid sick syndrome is actually a case where there is no intrinsic thyroid disease. So it is going to be findings of abnormal thyroid hormone levels with no intrinsic thyroid disease. We're going to talk about this in more detail when we talk about the diagnosis later on. So it is not a true syndrome or condition. It's going to be due to some other underlying condition that is affecting thyroid hormone levels. Now, because we see this occurring in conditions where individuals are sick or are injured, we can often see this in hospitalized patients. So it's been found that approximately 10% of hospitalized patients are found to have low TSH levels in the absence of thyroid pathology. Again, remember that there's no actual thyroid disease. It is a change in levels of thyroid hormones, and this is more likely to occur with increasing severity of illness. So as a patient gets sicker or if there's a more serious injury, we can see larger changes in thyroid hormones in those patients. So as mentioned before, euthyroid sick syndrome is a case where we see changes in thyroid hormone levels due to some other underlying condition. So it occurs in the context of a non-thyroidal illness or an NTI. So non-thyroidal illness can be many different types of illnesses. We're going to talk about them here in this slide. So some of the potential causes of euthyroid sick syndrome include the following. Pulmonary diseases, gastrointestinal and hepatic conditions, so chronic gastrointestinal conditions like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. We can also see it with chronic hepatitis and cirrhosis. Renal disorders like kidney failure, cardiovascular diseases, myocardial infarction, so that's a heart attack, trauma including burns, surgery, serious infections and sepsis, metabolic disorders, autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, starvation, and cancers or malignancies. So all these conditions can lead to euthyroid sick syndrome, whether they are acute or chronic conditions. And again, the more serious the condition, the more likely we are going to see euthyroid sick syndrome. So why does this happen? What is the pathophysiology? So the pathophysiology is not entirely understood, but what is believed to happen is that in the case of a certain condition or trauma or injury or surgery, whatever the case may be, what may happen is the following. That condition may lead to an inhibition of synthesis and release of TRH, which is thyrotropin releasing hormone, which is a hormone from the hypothalamus, and TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, which comes from the pituitary gland. A condition may also lead to alterations in thyroid hormone synthesis and release, so there can be issues with suppression of certain enzymes like diiodinases. And another possible pathophysiological mechanism may be where the underlying condition leads to a disruption of the target tissue's ability to respond to thyroid hormones. So this can occur through TR or thyroid receptor downregulation, thyroid binding globulin reduction, etc. So all of these are potential pathophysiological mechanisms as to why a potential underlying sickness or illness can disrupt thyroid hormones and their release or functioning. And a more specific way that these particular mechanisms may be disrupted is through cytokines or more specifically interleukins. So in particular infections, especially or in autoimmune conditions, we can have release of interleukins. And interleukins may be playing a role in some of these disruptions we talked about here. So I also want to mention that as well. So there aren't any characteristic findings in euthyroid sick syndrome. The underlying non-thyroidal illness, whether that be a pulmonary disease or a cardiovascular disease or some other condition we talked about before, is going to determine the signs and symptoms we see in a patient. So even with disrupted thyroid hormones or low thyroid hormones, there is no clinical hypothyroidism in these cases. However, the changes in blood levels of thyroid hormones and 
the other signs and symptoms from whatever underlying condition is causing changes in blood levels may actually mask signs and symptoms of a pre-existing thyroid disease. So I also want to mention that here. So again, no specific findings we see with euthyroid 6 syndrome. It's going to be found on blood work and it's going to be disruption of thyroid hormone levels due to some other underlying condition. So let's talk about diagnosis. So the diagnosis of euthyroid 6 syndrome includes having blood work to measure thyroid hormones, including T3 or triiodothyronine, T4 or thyroxine, and TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, among others. So what we're going to see in euthyroid 6 syndrome is low serum T3 and high serum reverse T3 or RT3. So this is going to be an important pattern to recognize. We're going to see in euthyroid 6 syndrome low T3 and high reverse T3. Reverse T3 is T3, but where the iodines are in different positions. So it's an inactive form of T3. Now, it's also important to note that RT3 may not be elevated in renal disease. And in some cases, patients may have low T4 as well. And this is going to occur in more severe cases. So it's also important to note as cases become more and more severe, they're more likely to have low T4. There are cases where we see high T4, and we're going to talk about those here in a moment. And again, what's very important to make note of is the fact that this is a case where we see changes in thyroid hormone levels. And these are the patterns we're going to see, but there's no evidence of pre-existing thyroid and or hypothalamic pituitary disease. So it's only going to be found on blood work. So again, the most important pattern of seeing these hormone levels in euthyroid 6 syndrome is a low T3, a high RT3. In some cases, if the patient is experiencing a very severe underlying condition, especially if they're in ICU, for instance, they can have low T4, and then they can also have low free T4. I also want to talk about some classifications that can be used for euthyroid 6 syndrome. One of them is going to be low T3 syndrome, so this is going to be the majority of cases. Again, this is going to be the hallmark finding in euthyroid 6 syndrome. Low T4 syndrome can occur, but again, it's going to occur in severe cases, and then in some more rare cases and more particular conditions, high T4 can occur. So this would be what we would call high T4 syndrome. And this is going to occur in acute intermittent porphyria, chronic hepatitis, and HIV infections. So how is euthyroid 6 syndrome treated? So because this isn't a condition on its own, it's caused by an underlying condition, it's important to treat the underlying cause. So treating the underlying cause is going to be important for resolving the thyroid hormone alterations. So after the underlying cause is treated, there is a complete reversal of thyroid hormone abnormalities. In some cases, we can see there may be some overcorrection of thyroid hormone levels. So in some cases, we can see a transient elevation of TSH, for instance, so thyroid stimulating hormone. So there may be a slight dip during the sickness, but after recovery, we can see a slight increase in thyroid stimulating hormone. And then it's also important to repeat thyroid hormone measurements. So these measurements are going to be important after the underlying condition is treated. And then what's very important to take away here is that low T4 levels are correlated with a worse prognosis. So remember that we talked about in most cases, now there are some of those odd or particular conditions that can increase T4, but in most cases, the more severe the condition, the lower the T4 levels will be. So if we see low T4 levels in a patient that doesn't have a pre-existing thyroid disease and they are experiencing a particular condition, that low T4 level is correlated with a worse prognosis. So very important to pick up on this as well. So this condition can be important to recognize because in some cases, a practitioner may be confused if they were to actually check patients' thyroid hormone levels when they are sick or ill. So they may actually see that there are changes in thyroid hormone levels that may look like the patient has a thyroid disease, but they actually don't. They may only have issues with thyroid hormone levels due to some other underlying condition. So that's also important to note at the end of this lesson. If you want to learn more about other thyroid conditions, please check out my lesson on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.